In the modern day world, tens of millions of people are dependent on wireless communication for their day to day lives. In fact, without the invention of wireless communication, thousands of people would have died. Millions of modern day jobs simply wouldn't exist, and cancer treatment would be next to impossible. Every time a person tunes into their television or dials up on their cellular phone, they are depending on wireless communication to be successful. Whenever Air Force officers or ship captains scan the sky and water for incoming planes and ships, they are dependent on wireless communication for the safety and survival of the people. Ever since the beginning of mankind, communication has proved to be one of the most important aspects of human lives. In or around 5000 BC, cavemen supposedly used great smoking fires to relay messages to other cavemen in the vicinity. Between 3400 and 3200 BC, the first written forms of languages were produced by the Egyptians and the Sumerians. By 521 BC, the Persians created the first credible postal system, making communication in farther lands more possible. Several thousand years ensued in which little improvement was made in the field of communication. Finally, in 1840, Samuel Morse invented the telegraph a machine that had a lever that would send electric currents for wires to be received on the other end of the line. Following the telegraph would be one of the most important inventions ever to come to Earth. In 1820, Danish scientist Hans Christian Orsted discovered that electric currents gave off a magnetic effect, and so he named them electromagnetic waves. In 1825, Michael Faraday accidentally discovered that electricity could make magnetism and soon proved that magnetism could make electricity. In 1864, Scottish theorist James Clerk Maxwell put Michael Faraday's work into mathematical form and thereby came to a proposal that electromagnetic waves could be created and used according to Faraday's discovery. However, Maxwell never tried to fulfill his own predictions. In the late 1880s, German scientist Heinrich Kurtz set out to prove Maxwell correct by performing several of his own experiments. Kurtz then conducted an experiment that sent waves from one space to another, and then he placed a coherer, which could detect electromagnetic waves, between the two. With this feat completed, many became interested in this new system, but none could get the waves to travel more than a few feet. Kurtz, however, died rather unexpectedly before his experiment could ever be put to real use. In 1885, Professor Augusto Riggi improved Hertz's transmitter and receiver so that they could more easily send and receive the waves. By age 14, young Italian Guglielmo Marconi was extremely fascinated by Hertz's work and dreamed of a wireless world. At age 20, in 1894, Marconi began to experiment on replicating Hertz's experiment and even conducting a few of his own. That year, Marconi brought his experiment to Augusto Riggi at the Bologna College. Riggi warned young Marconi that it was useless, the waves could travel no more than a few feet. Marconi, undiscouraged, returned to his work. In December of 1895, Marconi conducted his own version of Hertz's experiment. He used Alessandro Volta's battery for power and Michael Faraday's iron coil for the electromagnetism. The experiment was successful, but only over a few feet. Marconi was still determined to prove Riggi wrong by distancing the sender and the receiver across the attic of Villa Grafone, but the waves didn't travel well through the air. Marconi tried many different shapes, sizes, and metals for the wires, but was never strong enough to jump the distance. Finally, Marconi discovered that when he placed a zinc aerial sheet at the sending end and a copper aerial sheet at the receiving end, the electricity would jump. Ecstatic, Marconi moved out into the gardens of Villa Grafone. In autumn of 1895, Marconi was stretching the distance between sender and receiver, inch by inch, foot by foot, making minor adjustments along the way. Marconi w soon was able to develop a sender and a receiver that was far more powerful than Professor Riggi's. In October of 1895, Marconi strung his ascending equipment on top of a pole in the garden and had his brother go to the other side of the hill with the receiver. Marconi tapped the lever and waited. No more than two seconds later, a rifle shot rang out through the valley. The signal was through. Thrilled, Marconi turned to the Italian post office in February of 1896 for his next move. He contacted them by telegraph, telling them about his experiment. 
they quickly replied that they were not interested. When Marconi's older British cousin came to his house for a visit, Marconi showed him his experiment. His cousin was rather shocked that the Italian post office had turned him down and said that somebody was bound to be interested in his experiment in London. Following his cousin's lead, Marconi contacted Sir William Preece, who was engineer-in-chief of the General Post Office in London. Preece himself was an engineer of telegraphy, so he took great interest when Marconi came to him with his equipment. Marconi conducted a short-range test in front of Preece, who promised an arrangement with the post office, knowing that this invention would be a success. On September 2nd, 1896, Marconi again gathered all of his equipment and headed for London. He set up his sending equipment on top of the post office building, and just over a mile away set up the receiver. Marconi tapped the lever three times for the Morse letter S and waited. On the other building, the British erupted into cheers as three dots blinked by on the receiver. In January of 1897, Marconi, along with some newly employed helpers, strung aerials onto tall poles that would reflect the signals in different directions. In March of 1897, the growing distance had reached a total of four miles. For May of 1897, Marconi and his crew set up a plan to send a signal from the British mainland to Flatholm Island, a distance of over 11 miles. Once again, Marconi prevailed. The British now openly boasted of Marconi's success with them. So in July of 1897, Italy practically begged Marconi to come back. Marconi accepted and immediately was asked to perform several tests in front of the Italian Navy for the first ever ship-to-shore wireless signal. Later that year, Marconi founded the Marconi Company to pursue the idea of one day becoming a worldwide producer of wireless. The company set up simple radio stations at hotels where curious onlookers gazed at the crackles and sparks his invention emitted. In March of 1899, the tests were responding to a reliable 30 miles, so the Marconi Company decided to take another step towards wireless across the Atlantic. On March 27th, the Marconi Company set up a sender and a receiver on either side of the English Channel, each antenna over 100 feet tall. Once again, Marconi was successful. Throughout the summer of 1899, Marconi dreamed of sending wireless across the Atlantic. The European side of the transmission was decided in 1899 as Poldu, Great Britain. Not until 1901 was an adequate spot found with the receiver on the North American side, Lace Bay, Canada. Several weeks of grinding work later, the kite aerials were ready for release in Glace Bay. Severe weather delayed the release of the kites until December 11th. On the 11th, two aerial kites were launched into the icy sky while the Marconi company sat huddled in the receiving room below. Within an hour, one kite had ripped free and the other was threatening to follow. Two and a half hours of torturing silence later, three barely audible dots blipped faintly and were followed by another. The Marconi Company was overjoyed. They had prevailed through what was deemed impossible by nearly every scientist three years prior. Several incidents occurred in which Marconi's invention proved to be life-saving. In 1909, two ships collided in the thick fog and they were surely going to sink. But there was a radio on the second ship and they were able to contact the shore. 1,700 lives were saved. In 1912, the Titanic sank into the icy waters off the coast of Canada all due to lack of communication in the wireless room and too few lifeboats. 1,500 lives were lost. The years from 1925 to 1950 are often known today as the heydays of radio. Music, drama, television programs and interviews filled the airways and a new form of entertainment was founded. Throughout the 1900s, many inventions evolved from Marconi's, including the television, the cellular phone, radar, cancer radiation, internet and the World Wide Web, and microwaves. The modern world today is supported by wireless, and all thanks to a curious teenager in the attic of Villagraphone.